Hello, children of God, members of the household of God, my brothers, my sisters. You know, there's a lot of angst and anxiety going on all over the world, actually, right now. It was the Wuhan uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 thing going on. There was the uh, worldwide uh, reaction to the killing of George Floyd. And so what we're seeing going on is a lot of upset. Uh, economies are down because of lockdown. Businesses are going bankrupt. Maybe your business. Places of employment have laid you off, perhaps. A lot going on. Uh, certainly not just in America or, or Europe, but also the, um, the white farmers of South Africa. Many of them have been attacked and killed. And on and on, all over the country, all over the world, we can see uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, probably wondering what mainland China is trying to do. So in all of this, what are we, the children of God, supposed to do? Well, I think we follow scripture. It says to set our minds on things above. So for example, in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, if you are raised with Christ, we were crucified with Christ, we are resurrected in Christ in the baptism, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So today I'm urging all of us, be with me in this sermon, as one of the things we're going to set our mind on is the coming wedding of the Lamb and of His bride. The Bible is very specific who the bride is. There are guests, I want to make sure that's really plain today. Who they are, the Bible does not clearly say, but I'll give you my opinion on it. But overall, I think a good, a good thing to practice is where the Bible is silent. We don't try to be ultra dogmatic. Where the Bible is definite, of course we are dogmatic. So hello everybody, I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock. Really happy to have you here with us. Uh, let others know about this website if you find it's helping you, feeding you, and encouraging you. So today we're continuing the topic of the marriage of the Lamb, part two. There will actually be three parts. Uh, the first part is where it is. The second part is who all is going to be there besides the bride and groom. Who else will be there? And you'll be surprised, I think, by some of the things. And then part three will be when will the resurrection of the first fruits be and what will happen? Uh, when will be the wedding? I think you'll find it uh, very exciting. David said he'd just as soon be a doorkeeper in the house of his God, in the temple, rather than enjoying a thousand days. One day in your courts is better than a thousand. Somewhere else is what he said in Psalm 84, verse 10. And uh, I think that's a good thing to understand, too, that if we're not the bride, if you find yourself not being the bride, it's, it's okay. Just being there in the first resurrection in the house of God is going to be very spectacular. So I'm giving this because it is tied to Pentecost season, but it's also uh, a way to get our uh, focusing on the world refocused on God, on the coming kingdom that will be coming to earth at some time. The kingdom of God is alive and well in heavenly Jerusalem right now. And now we pray thy kingdom come. And so to end all this madness that we see going on. The most spectacular ceremony of all times that the universe has ever seen is about to take place in just a few more years, uh, whether that's 10 more years or whether that's 15 or 20 or 7 or 8 more years. I don't think it's that far away anymore, uh, but it will take place fairly soon. The wedding of God, the Son of God, Most High, to His bride, the church, in heavenly Jerusalem with streets of gold, with massive walls around the city. The wedding of the Son of God to the bride is about to take place in, in a very short time. And then what happens after that is going to rock the planet like never before. And there will be a lot of great changes. But before that, there are going to be some very, very dramatic things happening. So forget the, so the storybook weddings of Cinderella. Uh, someone poor marrying into the royalty. Does that sound familiar? And the beautiful ballroom and the dances. But that's fiction. But what I'm talking about isn't going to be fiction. It's going to pale into insignificance, the weddings of royalty that we have seen, Diana and Prince Charles, and other royalty that we have seen over the years. They were good, 
but they won't be nearly as good as when God the Father throws a party and a wedding for his son and for the bride. That's going to be spectacular in heavenly Jerusalem, and you will be part, part of it. So quit being depressed about what's going on. Focus on things above. That's what God wants us to do. And uh, so listen, please, to part one, if you haven't heard it first. Uh, the wedding of all weddings is going to definitely be in heaven. I covered that in detail in part one. Here's a quick summary, but I won't repeat a lot of it. We know that because the wedding is put on by God himself in Matthew 22, verse 1, and that it says the king comes in to see the guests, we know this wedding will be where God the Father is. And when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, right? That tells us where it's going to be because Father is going to be there. The loaves that were presented on Pentecost by the high priest are raised up high, are raised towards heaven because that pictures, and the loaves, by the way, the, 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 they're called first fruits in Leviticus 23, verse 17. They're called first fruits. And James 1, 18 says, we are first fruits. The church, those being called now are first fruits. What happens? They're waved as two leavened loaves up to heaven and then their arms brought back down again. And probably picturing those who have died in Christ, as Paul separates the two categories in 1 Thessalonians 4, the, the, those who have died in Christ, and then those, secondly, who, who remain and are alive. That's probably what the two loaves, the Bible doesn't, doesn't tell us what the two loaves represent. It just says they're two loaves. So once again, we ride loose in the saddle when it comes to what the scripture doesn't clearly say. It does say they're first fruits, though. And the Bible does say we are first fruits. So anyway, the bride definitely is the true body of Christ. Paul makes that really clear in Ephesians 5 and in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. I have betrothed you uh, as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then we also talked about last time I, I, uh, Isaac and Rebekah and how Rebekah at the end of Genesis 24 is taken by Isaac into his mother's tent. Galatians 4 tells us that Sarah, Isaac took her to Sarah's tent, Sarah, Isaac's mother, represents Jerusalem above. So that tells us something too, and I really believe Isaac pictured Christ, just like Abraham pictured God the Father. Isaac pictured Christ, Rebekah pictured the church. They were taken into, or they went into Sarah's tent. Galatians 4 says that was Jerusalem above. All the details are in my sermon part 1. And then in Revelation 19, to me it's very clear that Revelation 19, verse 1, verse 4, verse 10, uh, it says very clearly these things happen, are happening in heaven, in heaven. And then right in the midst of all of that, Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9, is the passage about the wedding itself. I'm going to read this time from the, the New Living Translation. Let's be glad and rejoice. Let's give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and the bride has prepared herself. She's given the finest of pure white linen to wear, given it. And for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. A bride is not invited to a wedding. She is part of the wedding. She's what the wedding, she and her groom, are what the wedding is all about. So those invited to the wedding, Revelation 19, are called to the wedding, verse 9 are the guests. And uh, so today I'm focusing on who else besides, especially besides the bride and groom, who else will be there? Matthew 22, verse 1, the king is God the Father, puts on a wedding for his son, Jesus Christ. And then the servants were told, go and fill the guests with, fill the hall with guests. Many of them declined when it came down to it. So they went out and got whoever they could find, good and bad, it says in Matthew 22. And then in verse 10, the wedding hall was filled with guests. God's not going to put on a tiny little wedding. That means a lot of people are there as guests. And every wedding I've ever been a part of, the guests outnumbered the bride and groom. And then verse 11, it says he went out to see the guests and saw someone there not properly attired. He wasn't going to put on that wedding attire that they were given to put on. Uh, the very wealthy and the kings and so on, they, they, they gave you robes and outfits to wear because most people couldn't afford to have a 
proper wedding attire. By the way, don't ever go to a wedding in a stained blue jeans and, and t-shirt. It's just, it's just not right. And even Matthew 22 tells us that's not right. That we should show honor to the one hosting, the, the, to the bride and groom and to the host, putting it on. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2 and 3 says, I have betrothed you, verse 2 actually, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Anyway, so it's real, real clear in Ephesians 5 that uh, the bride is the church. And uh, who composes the church? Now God is calling people from all over the world. Look at Galatians 3, verses 26 to 29. I'll just hit the highlights. You're all children or sons of God, all of you, through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ that put on Christ. Now he says it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek or male or female or rich or poor or slave or free or whatever. The things that we say matter between us don't matter. You're all one in Christ. The children of God are called various things in Scripture besides children of God, household of God. They're called that. They're called sons and daughters. They're called the elect. They're called the bride. They're called the little flock. First fruits, the church, all of those are names for the children of God, the church. And heavenly Jerusalem above where the Father dwells becomes our city. I think I touched on that last time, that there will be lots of cities in the new heavens and new earth. But heavenly Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven, Revelation 21 and 22, becomes our city. So much so that it's actually even referred to as the bride. In Revelation 21, verse 2, I, I, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven, out of heaven, prepared as a bride. And then verse 9, one of the seven angels comes to John and says, Come, I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he showed me, verse 10, the holy city, Jerusalem, descending from heaven. I was summarizing some of those verses. So, God's not, Christ is not marrying the city, but the city becomes identified with the bride, as I clearly showed you in 2 Corinthians 11 to Ephesians 5 and others in the first sermon. So the bride is the church of God, those being called out of the world now, fighting sin, overcoming with Christ's power in us, Christ's presence in us, and the bride has to be, now I'm going to move to a different topic here, but it's all part of being the bride. You and I, if we're going to marry Yeshua, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we have to be of the same kind as He is. We have to. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God created every animal. Uh, he, he called them out. They came out of the ground. and They're formed. And uh, kind reproduce after kind, kind after the animal kind. And uh, there are different kinds. There's the God kind. There's the angelic kind. There's human kind, and there's animal kind, fish kind, bird kind, and so on. And they, uh, they come together in their own kind. And so in Genesis 2, <clears throat> so in Genesis 2, God is given the task to Adam. God, God gives Adam the task of naming the animals. And he calls the animals, brings them, some of them anyway, to Adam. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of species out there. So there's no way Adam could have named them all. But, but just as, to make the point, in Genesis 2, verses 18 to 22, Genesis 2, 18 to 22, Yehovah God, okay, the Lord God, Yehovah Elohim, says it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Not a giraffe, not a dog, not a cow, not a horse, not a turtle but someone just like he is, same kind as he is. So out of the ground, the Lord God, Yehovah Elohim, formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. What a great God we have. Uh, he, God didn't say, I'm going to call him this and Adam, that's the name. God let Adam have this. Let's do that with our own kids and grandkids. Let them have some decisions. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Now verse 20. So Adam gave names to the cattle, birds, and the, every beast of the field. But for Adam, it seems like this was God's real intent. 
For Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him among those animals, okay? For Adam, he didn't find the helper. So he put him into a deep sleep, and God takes out a rib, verse 21, 22, or part of his side, and from that he forms, he builds, is what the Hebrew says. Uh, he, he made into, he built a woman, and he brought her to the man. So now Adam marries her, and this is now kind after he is, and they become one. Romans 5.14 says of Adam that he was a type of Yeshua, who was what the Bible refers to as the second Adam. So at the first resurrection of the saints, steps are being taken to change us to be of the same kind as Christ is. He's spirit kind. He's part of the God kind. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Yeshua, the Word, was uh, subordinate to God the Father, who is called God Most High. And over and over, Yeshua says, My Father is greater than I. All my words are His words. All my works are His works. I do what my Father says. I obey Him. But He also, Christ also, was God. So what happens, you can, I'll just post it up here while I'm talking about it. 1 Corinthians 15 Verses 44 to 45 and verse 49 says, Our bodies are flesh. Just like the first Adam was, was a fleshly body, a natural body. But the last Adam, verse 45, became, that's, that's Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Because John 4, 24 says God is spirit. And so in his spirit form right now, Christ is spirit. God is spirit. The angels are spirits, but they're not of the same kind. <clears throat> Verse 49, And as we have borne the image of the man, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That's Christ. We shall also be just like him. Paul earlier in 1 Corinthians 15 compares what we'll be like to the various astral bodies. Some are brighter and bigger, flashier than others, but they're all bright and flashy. Uh, Daniel 12, 3 says we'll shine like the expanse, like the, uh, like the heavens, like the sky in all its brightness. Yeshua himself said in Matthew 13, 43, that the saints, the righteous, shall shine like the sun in all its fullness and glory. Matthew 13, 43. So that all happens at the resurrection, at the blink of an eye, when our bodies are changed to spirit, at the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 53, which I read last time, and it says we put off, in, uh, put off mortality and put on immortality. We become immortal. We're not eternal, because eternal means you've always existed. Okay, we are immortal. Wow. So how can we not be excited about that? The last shofar sounds... I meant to have my shofar here. And the dead in Christ are raised first. They're changed to spirit, to bright, shining, beautiful beings in the glory of God himself. And then we which, are, which remain in our lives shall be caught up with them. We're also changed in the blink of an eye to an immortal being. And then what happens after that? We meet Christ in the clouds. And the story of of Rebecca and Isaac, at least, Isaac had her brought to him, which is what happened here, and then he took her into Sarah's tent, symbolizing Jerusalem above. We're changed to spirit. Now we can meet him, see him in all his glory. And he and the, God the Father, we can see him in all his glory because 1 John 3, verse 2, very clearly says, Beloved, now we're the children of God, Yet it's not revealed yet what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him. When he shall be revealed, I think that verse there may be talking about Christ, or if it talks about the Father, it doesn't matter. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is in all his glory. We're going to see that. No human can see God the Father or Christ in all his glory and live. We just can't. Uh, some uh, were allowed to see Christ in a, like in a vision, like at the transfiguration in his glory. 
But we won't be human anymore. We're going to be spirit beings. And we're going to be in the family of God. All I know is when I see the child of a dog, it's a dog. When I see the child of a horse, it's a horse. When I see the child of a carrot, it's a carrot. Kind after kind. So when God calls me his son, and calls you his daughter, calls us his children, what is that telling us? Are we going to be something different? No, God is expanding his family. God the Father will always be God the Father, God Most High. But it exalts God when he has children that come into his family by the billions at some point. That exalts him. It doesn't take away from him. I'm not going to be an angel. I'm not going to be a human. When I'm changed to, to spirit, I'm going to be of the God family. A child of God, as God is. The same kind of family. I have, a, um, I have a sermon on that about our astonishing, incredible, whatever the word is I used, uh, future. I'll put it in the notes. Um, that, that's what we're going to be. And so anyway, uh, just like him. So, so we're able to marry him because we'll be the same kind as Eve was able to marry Adam, being of the same kind. This change that we're going to go through, changing our body to a spirit glorious body, has to be happening in a way now, not that the body has changed to glory yet, but we're supposed to be people who are done with liking sin. We're done with wanting to be like the world. We want to be like Christ. We're done. Peter says, you know, they think it's strange that we don't walk like we used to, our old friends. But we're done with that. We don't find it fun anymore to watch sinners sin in movies or any other way. We certainly don't talk like sinners talk. We talk like Christ would talk, with grace and with beauty, with uh, encouragement. And uh, too many of you and I, at times, get involved in the world so much in our Facebook, and we start using language and tones and attitudes that frankly don't reflect the Spirit of God. So let's wake up from that and realize that we are supposed to be transforming into the very image of Christ. Now, Christ spoke out against the Pharisees. Christ spoke out a bit against uh, the religious ways of his time. But he was not disrespectful. Of course, he was very God, too, in the flesh. And the, the Word became flesh in John 1, 14. The Word was God. Anyway, back to the bride. How many people will make up the bride as one body of Christ? Many think it's 144,000. The Bible doesn't say that. That's an inference people are making. I think, now we can agree to disagree on this, okay, folks? We can. But I think the bride will be significantly more than that, maybe a half a million, a million or more. And that would still be a little flock compared to the 20, 30, 40 billion who have ever lived. There's eight and a half billion right now. Why would it be hard to imagine 20 or, or more billion the days before the flood, they lived to be 900 years and had lots of kids. So 20 to 40 billion is what some people have estimated the world's ever had. Even if we have a million or even two million in the first resurrection, that's a tiny, tiny flock. So whatever it will be, it will be a fraction of the total population. So value that calling you've been given. But I don't think you and I could even begin to imagine how spectacular that wedding's going to be how incredibly exciting it's going to be to be changed to spirit. Many of you are hurting. Many of you have rheumatoid arthritis or strokes or just plain aging. Many of you have, are suffering with cancer or have suffered with it. That's all going to be in the past. You're going to leap like a, like a, like a little lamb that's been cooped up for a long time or, or a little cow, a little calf cooped up. There's a verse that says that. You're going to hop out of there and wow! Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, we can't even imagine it. Put that on the board here, 1 Corinthians 2.9. Eye hasn't seen or ear heard, nor has it even entered our hearts how, uh, to try to imagine it, what God's prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So we're starting to see bits of it. But when it actually happens and you finally arrive in heavenly Jerusalem, next time I'll say when all that happens, 
and we look at the angels around us and we look at the, the homes and places God has prepared for us, why do we get down and depressed by what's going on around us? Why? Let's come out of that. And I have, I'm preaching this to me because I was getting too involved in all these protests and riots and violence and arson and killings. Yeah, I live in this planet, but I really am a citizen of God, first and foremost, of his kingdom. So anyway, the church is composed of anyone led by God's spirit, uh, Romans, 8, 9, uh, Romans 8, 9 and 14, uh, from Abel till, till now. They had the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. The bride, I believe, are people who have had the, the spirit for quite some time, have been tested and tried and refined like gold and silver in the fire. They've come through a lifetime, haven't you, of test, suffering, of being tested, of being tried, of even being tempted. You've had temptations. You've had to face and, and rebuke and overcome. Some you lost, some you won. But more and more, we're winning that battle. We're becoming more and more like Christ. We learn to repent. We learn to come back to him. Here's something else. I believe everyone led by God's Spirit in this life all who have accepted Christ as their Savior, all who have said, the God of Israel is my God. I'm talking about in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all that, and Moses. They will be in the first resurrection, the ones, the ones who have received and been led by the Holy Spirit. Many of the prophets and the, some of the kings, the uh, Bible is very clear. Joseph had God's Spirit. Caleb had God's Spirit. I have a blog on... Uh, did, the, uh, did the righteous in the Old Testament have God's Spirit? I have a blog on it. But I don't believe everyone in the first resurrection, though they will be first fruits, I don't think that all first fruits will be part of the bride. All of the bride will be first fruits, but not all first fruits will be the bride. Some of the first fruits, I believe, will be guests. There have to be guests there. Angels aren't the guests. Angels are the servers, the servants who serve us. Besides guests and the bride and groom, there will be other functions. I'll get to that. But all of them will be first fruits. So who are the guests? You know what? Scripture doesn't tell us. But it tells us there will be guests. That much we know. So who might they be? I believe that those who come out of the Great Tribulation and have died in it, died in it from the point of view that they will not give up the name of Yeshua, they will not put on uh, the beast system, they will not become a part of its system, and that will become very clear to us as time goes on. And I hope you and I are brave enough to take the consequences and say, no, I want no part of that system. None. So Revelation 7, verse 14 onwards, it talks about a great multitude that can't be numbered. And at the last minutes, hours of their days of their life, they do come over to Christ. They apparently died in the Great Tribulation. They have, they, but they weren't tested for a lifetime. But they were tested with their very life. And they gave that test and they won that test. But I think these might be the guests at the wedding. They'll be there. They'll be at the wedding. But I think they might be the guests. Let's read about them in Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. I'll just hit portions of it, but we'll post portions as I go up there. Um, these might be people that right now keep Sunday, have Christmas. Uh, they, they claim to believe in Christ, but, uh, you know, they, they don't follow the whole Bible. But uh, they want to, but, but you know, they, 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 there's a lot they're not doing, but they probably will recognize enough that it, when the beast system really kicks in, they'll say, I want no part of that. And God will honor them by putting them in the first resurrection. But will they be the bride? Perhaps not. And if they are part of the bride, hallelujah, let's welcome them. Maybe they'll welcome us. <laughs> Revelation 7, 9 to 17, after these things I saw a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. That means they've washed them in the blood of the Lamb. And all the angels, verse 11, stood around the throne, praising and blessing God. Verse 13, one of the elders came and said to me, 
who do you think these are? Who are these people in the white robes? And verse 14, I, he says, I don't know, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones, verse 14, who come out of great tribulation, the great tribulation, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What does that tell us? It tells us they've deeply repented of all their sins in the past. They have accepted Yeshua as their Savior. And he sees them as cleansed. There's now no condemnation against them, Romans 8, 1, just like us. He sees them as washed. Verse 15, therefore, they're before the throne of God. Look where this is. And they serve him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Verse 17, the lamb who's in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. That means they're part of the flock. They're part of the flock. They're part of the first fruits. God wipes away every tear from their eyes. They, these might be you know, the bride as well. I don't know. All I know is there are going to be guests, and I'm just trying to figure out who that might be. And I think they might be these great multitude from all nations. In Revelation 15, it talks about a group that's there standing on the sea of glass. Let's post that up there. And uh, verse 2, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, standing on that sea of glass. And remember what it said in Revelation 7, 14, that the great multitude were those who came out of great tribulation. So they obviously didn't give in to the beast system. They just didn't. So anyway, verse chapter 15, Revelation 15, verse 2 says, These came out, okay, uh, these are those who have victory over the beast, over his image, his mark, over the number of his name. So they, so they stand on the, it seems like a similar, uh, when will the beast system be most dominant? It will be during the Great Tribulation. We'll start seeing, we're already seeing, I think, some glimpses of it, where we lose our rights and our civil rights in the Western countries so easily, so quickly with lockdowns and things, and that we use a virus as an excuse, and it seems like a plausible excuse, so we give in to it. But then all of a sudden we can't say what we want to say. Uh, you're not, you're not, you know, freedom of speech has become freedom to speak what the left says is okay to speak. That's not freedom of speech. So we're seeing glimpses of it already. So anyway, a great multitude from all nations, the Gentiles, in other words, uh, from all nations are being converted. That's 195 nations. And that's only possible because of things like the internet, things like what we're doing here and others are doing, that allows the word of God to go into all nations. So there will be guests. Who they are, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I suspect it might be the great multitude. And I also suspect, if we hop over to Revelation 7, the great multitude comes out of the Gentile nations, the non-Israel uh, nations. And then Revelation 7 says that there are 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel in the last days who are also being set apart as special. Revelation 7 lists the 144,000 and the great multitude. In the context, in context, Revelation 7 comes after Revelation 6, and Revelation 6 lists six seals. The fifth seal is the Great Tribulation. The sixth seal is the heavenly signs. After the sixth seal, we're ready for the seventh seal, and the angels are told, wait, before you continue with any more plagues and trumpets and, and all kinds of horrible things in the next few chapters of Revelation, we have to protect these 144,000, so they must still be alive, otherwise they wouldn't need to be protected. If they're still alive, that's not including people like Abel, Noah, and Abraham, and Peter, and Paul, because they're dead. If you're dead, why would you need to be protected? And yet there are many who believe the 144,000 is the number of those in the bride. But if you read the end of chapter 6, the beginning of chapter 7, yourself, carefully, you will see 
that this is talking about people who come into God's view at the very end of the sixth seal after the great tribulation. So Revelation 7, 1, after these things I saw four angels, blah, blah, blah. And then verse 2, then I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. I didn't mean to say blah, blah, blah. That might sound, uh, that might sound uh, like I'm not giving proper credence to the Bible. I don't mean that. I just meant etc. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the sea, the earth I mean, the sea or the trees, until, here we go, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. Now we who have God's Spirit, the Bible says, are already sealed. So we don't need to be sealed in the future. So it's not talking about God's people who are being called and given God's Spirit today, or in Paul's day, or Peter's day, or in Abraham's day. It just isn't, because we're sealed already. And those who have died until now, who have had God's Spirit, they don't need to be protected either. So the teaching that the 144,000 includes everybody from Abel onwards, to me, makes no sense. Ephesians 4 verse 30, for example, says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. Ephesians 1 13, the end of it says, it mentions the gospel of your salvation. You see, everybody says, a lot of people say, not everybody, but a lot of people say, it's just the gospel of Christ or it's just the gospel of the kingdom. Here it talks about the gospel of your salvation. Gospel of grace. The gospel, it's all kinds of things that the, by the gospel is called. In whom, having believed, you were, go, go back now to Ephesians 1, 13, the end of it, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. So we don't have to be sealed again. So therefore, I don't believe the 144,000 is about the church of God, people uh, who, uh, who are his children, who have his spirit, who are being led by his spirit. And neither would it include, to me, any, I see no point in including Abraham, King David, and others who have died. They, they don't need to be protected. Nothing can harm them now. Uh, but then again, the description given to the same group, if it's, if it's the same 144,000, in Revelation 14, I think it's what makes a lot of people think this is the church because uh, they're called first fruits. And again, everybody in the first resurrection are first fruits. But I really don't believe, because you have to have guess, that all the first fruits are the bride. But Revelation 14 has some very glowing words about the 144,000, just like Revelation 15 had some very glowing words about another group. It doesn't call them 144 there, 144,000 in Revelation 15. I think Revelation 15 is another way of describing the great multitude from all nations. Revelation 14, the first five verses, I think is describing the, um, the 144, well, it says so. Let's, let's put it up there. Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. I looked, and behold, the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name on their forehead. Just like it says in Revelation 3 to Philadelphia, that I'll write on your forehead my Father's name and my name. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, the voice of a loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. So this is obviously in heaven. Where are the four living creatures? Where are the 24 elders? Where's the throne? In heaven. And by this time, Revelation 11, the seventh trump has already sounded. So all the first fruits are now in heaven at this point. No one could learn that song except those 144,000 redeemed from the earth. We are all, all the first fruits are redeemed from the earth. But not all the redeemed are necessarily going to be the bride, in my opinion. Otherwise, we, where do you find the guests? There, and these are the ones who were not defiled with women, talking about that spiritually. Idolatry is considered spiritual fornication and, and, and adultery. <clears throat> these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. 
they're redeemed among men, being first fruits, like the two barley loaves, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So what I'm saying is, all the first fruits will be in the first resurrection. All the first fruits go to heaven. Once there, some become the bride, some become the guests. And like David, who was happy to be a doorkeeper in the kingdom, just being in heaven, being the first fruits, being in the first resurrection, being in the wedding, what an honor. Uh, we all think it's the bride or nothing, but that, that's, that's carnal thinking. Let's get rid of that. So Revelation 14, uh, 4 says they are first fruits. They definitely, according to Revelation 7, come on the scene after the first six seals and are still alive. Um, and so I think, though many ministers disagree with me here, that the guests, I think, very likely include these who come in at the last minute, but who were not tested and tried and refined over decades or over a lifetime, like so many uh, who, are, who will be the bride have been. So I think they will be the guests. I could be wrong, okay? Since the Bible doesn't say, here are who the guests are, no minister, no speaker, nobody out there can definitively say who they are. And since the Bible nowhere says, nowhere, that the bride of Christ is composed of this number, I mean the 144,000 are never called the bride. They're called first fruits, but they're never called the bride. Neither are they called the guests. So that's something we have to wait to see what happens. Is that fair enough? I hope so. It's certainly not something we divide over or fight over, okay? Uh, so I think the 144,000 could include, I mean, could be included in the guests just as the great multitude from the Gentile nations. But we do know that the wedding is in heaven. The bride are the true spirit-led, tested and tried over their lifetime, children of God, and there will be guests. Now, something else. Let's move to something else now. When I look at any wedding I've ever been to, the guests vastly outnumber the bride and groom, right? Not only that, but we can't say that a wedding is composed only of the host putting it on, the bride and groom, and the guests. There's the minister, right, who's saying those words, or justice of the peace, wherever you go for your wedding. I hope you use a minister. But there are other people as well. They're bridesmaids. They're not guests. They're part of the wedding party. There are groomsmen, best man, flower girl, ring bearer. In our weddings today, we have many, many parts of or kinds of people who are not the bride and groom and not the guests. John the Baptist, for example, in uh, John 3.29, calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. Friend of the groom. Paul said he was one who was betrothing the church to Christ as a chaste virgin, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. So is he, is he including himself, therefore, as one who is also part of the bride, or is he in a different category? What I'm saying is this. President Trump, for example, has his bride, his wife. She has important roles. They certainly have their... He's, he and she are the ones that are most intimate together. But he also has a chief of staff. He also has a surgeon general. He also has an attorney general. He also has all his advisors. He also has his cabinet members. So they're part also of his team, but they're not his bride. I really think it's very possible that there are other people. Will Adam, I mean, will Abraham and, and uh, will Noah and Enoch, uh, will Daniel, will they be part of the bride or will they have very important posts working alongside Christ, but not necessarily as his bride? Why not? Don't get locked in to think, think it's got to be this or it's got to be that. Don't get locked into what I'm saying either. 
All I'm saying is that when it's all said and done, I think we'll be amazed, we'll be uh, awestruck at the beauty and the perfection when God puts this cubic cube puzzle together called who, who's all in the first resurrection and what their roles will be. I don't think everyone's going to be the bride or guest. Matthew 25 speaks of the ten virgins and nowhere calls them the bride either. Is it, it's just not plausible to me that half of the bride is left out like the five foolish and five wise virgins. Psalm 45, Psalm 45 verses 13 to 15, a prophecy about the wedding. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. Now, her companions aren't her. The virgins, her companions who follow her. Isn't it interesting? It's the same word that Yeshua used in Matthew 25. Ten virgins. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They, they all, the bride and her virgins, her companions, shall enter the king's palace. So we have the bride and the groom and the, and the bridesmaids, the companions. We have the, the, the friend of the groom that are clearly mentioned in Scripture. And, of course, there's the groom, Yeshua, and uh, his bride, the first fruits who have been tried and tested. And there will be guests, and there will be virgins who serve the bride. And so next time we'll cover when, when will all this take place? When will be the resurrection? Are you getting excited? I hope you are. This wedding on or near the sea of glass in heaven with God the Father there, and the rainbow covering his throne and the lightnings and the flashes and the thunderings and all the people who've ever been God's people. Home at last! Because New Jerusalem is our home. And for some, we, for some reason it does seem we'll know who's who. Peter, James, and John knew that was Moses and Elijah in the transfiguration. How did they know that? So we'll say, hey, look, there's David, there's Sarah, there's Abraham, there's Ruth and Boaz right there. There's Peter and Paul. And someone will be saying, and there's Philip or your name, whatever your name is, because you'll be there. Please be there. So it's going to be a wonderful wedding of the bride and the son of God in marvelous heavenly Jerusalem. And I think you're being called to be the bride or you'll at least be the guest. The bride has to become the same kind of being as Christ is. Just as he is the son of God, so are we. And when we're changed to the same kind, we will be fully sons of God, unable to sin. Unable to sin from that point. God cannot lie. We shall be like him. And we'll have glorious bodies shining like the sun. No wrinkles, no spots. I'm, I'm getting wrinkles. How about you guys? <laughs> I'll be 67 soon, you know, so. Getting old, but it doesn't matter. Even God himself is pictured in Revelation 1 as having really bright white hair. The wedding will include the host, God, the bridegroom, the issue of the Son of God, the bride, the guests, and probably others there as well who are not guests. We'll see angels there. We'll see the four living creatures. We'll see seraphim with the six wings. We'll see cherubim with the four wings. We'll see angels with no wings. We'll see angels that look like us. We'll see angels that look like eagles. There's a flying eagle, remember, that warns the whole world to repent and, the, and has the, God, the gospel of God that he's proclaiming, an eagle that flies around. Spirits, spirit horses. What do you think will be what we ride when we come back from heaven on white chargers? Those are angels. Those are angels. And someone will come up to you and say, Philip, I want you to meet your guardian angel who's watched over you. You kept him busy. Or you kept her busy. <laughs> 
whatever, here's this angel. I don't think they have male or female in, in the angelic world. They're, they're not male or female, but here's your angel. I'd like you to meet your angel, and I'd like to meet my angel. I don't want to miss one second of this. I don't want to miss one second of it by dwelling too long and hard on what's happening in this world today and getting all upset by what's happening in this world today. That's not what I'm about. I hope it's not what you're about. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Let's do what Jesus did. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let's run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, to Yeshua, the author, the finisher of our faith. He authors and finishes our faith. He will complete in us, you see. Philippians 1, 6 and 12 says that it's his righteousness. He will finish what he started. For who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its, cha its shame, and has sat down on the right hand of God and of, uh, in the right hand of God, the throne of God. Who, for the joy that was set before him, was able to despise everything else. That's the key. As Paul says in Philippians 3, 13 to 14, forgetting the past, forgetting the past, straining towards what lies ahead, and the upward call, the heavenly call that God's given us through Christ. That's what we need to be focused on. Not the riots, not the looting, not the injustices, not the racial inequality, not the overreach by some, not the virus, not the lockdowns, not the poverty we're going through. If we, I'm having a hard time making an income as well. That's okay. God will take care of me. So in this unsettling time, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the joy that's set before us, like Christ. In my next sermon, I'll talk about when all this is likely to happen. And I'm promising a sermon soon, too, on the peace and the storm of all of this. Great peace in the storm. Let's just ask God's dismissal. I'll see you next time at the part three, when this will all take place. I hope you're thrilled with what we're showing you today. Thrilled, even though you might know all this already, to have it be a reminder to you, to get your mind out of the muck and back into the joy set before you. Everything else is muck, <laughs> so let's do that. Dear Father in heaven, our holy God, our Father, our Daddy, God Most High, you're our very daddy. Father, we lift holy hands to you in prayer and worship, and we just ask you to fill our minds with your mind, with the mind of Jesus Christ, whose mind we're supposed to have in us. Let us follow your leading. Let us see what you have prepared for us as best as we can. Eye has not seen nor, nor ear heard the things which you prepared. Our hearts can't even imagine it. But you've reveal, revealed enough that help us get excited about it. Look forward to that and not be pulled down by temptations and tests and trials, but overcome through these and be able to be the bride, if that's what you're calling us to be, or guess, whatever you're calling us to be. Praises to you. We glorify your holy name. We ask you send Yeshua back soon. We ask you protect us from the perilous times we're in. And we ask that you watch over the the leaders of our countries, and because there are many who hate them, Father. But you told us to pray for them, and we do. We ask that you come soon. Come soon, Yeshua. Come soon. Send him, Father. And please, may we, may we be there with him. Please let us be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming. In Yeshua's mighty and holy name, we praise you, we bless you, we thank you so much. Yeshua's name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. 
We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.